So our next speaker, Luke Summerfield, is the founder of GDD at HubSpot, that's Growth Driven Design. He's asked me not to give him a big intro, he's way too humble for that. So I'm just going to invite him straight to the stage. Hands together, please, for Luke Summerfield. Thanks, sir. There you go. This was me at 2 a.m. working on my presentation, as people with jet lag typically do. Uh, but this was my face when I came across like a startling discovery. Does anyone in the crowd know what this is? What is it? A CD, or like CD-ROM is like the technical term for it. And I found it astonishing. It was astonishing for a few reasons. The first reason was, in the 90s, this was like the standard for delivering software to consumers. Which is pretty interesting, but it was more astonishing that people treated these things like they were their kids. They would polish them, they put them in safe places and cases. You know, if you treated them poorly, they would stop working. And I'm like, this is crazy. This is like a real thing, people. This, I'm not making this up. And the, other astonishing thing was they only released them like every two years. So Microsoft 95 team would be coding away, and then they'd go out, they'd release this to the public, and they'd go back into their dungeons and code again for two years until Microsoft 98 came out. And so they were only getting new software every two years. Pretty crazy when you think about modern times today. But in the background, there were three forces that were shifting in the software world. The first one was technology. So the internet was getting faster, server computing power was increasing, it was getting much cheaper to build things online. The second force was the process. Because the technology was advancing, it informed the way that companies would build software. They changed their team dynamics to introduce product managers and engineers and growth teams. They changed the feedback mechanisms they got. They were able to get more rich data about how people were using their software and increase the speed, the cycle on which they released software. And the third force was the way that companies thought about their software in, as a whole, as a business. How do we build peak performing software? And all of these three came together to create this little magical transition in the software world in the 90s. Does anyone have any ideas on what that was? Shout it out. Any ideas, 90s software? It's the SaaS revolution, the SaaS revolution that totally changed the way that companies brought software to market. We went from some companies making the transition very smoothly, companies like Microsoft going from CDs to Microsoft 365. You have other companies that did not make the transition quite as smoothly and are no longer here today. And then companies that were just a whisper in the 90s that now today started in SaaS and are the biggest companies in the world. So you may be wondering to yourself, Luke, what, what is this? this is a talk on web design. What does this have anything to do about web design? Well, my friends, these same exact forces are starting to change in the world of web design. The technology, the process, and the culture on which we think about building peak performing websites and how it impacts our business are changing, and there's a window of opportunity for us as companies. And that's my job here today is to get you to awaken on the changes that are coming and to give you some ideas on how you can take advantage of that as a business. We're going to talk about each one of these independently. We're going to start with culture. So this is a question for the group. The culture is kind of the why. Like, why do we have a website in the first place? So I'll ask that to you. Why do you have a website? What's that? Shop it's a shop window, your virtual window into what your company offers. What else? Why do you have a website? Sell to consumers, to sell directly online. Sell directly online. You deal a lot with e-commerce, you can literally purchase right online. Either go direct to consumer uh, and cut out some of the middlemen as well. What else? What other reasons do you have a website? Global reach. Global reach. No longer are you confined to who's in your local area. You now can sell to anyone who can have access to the internet. And I think all of that is, is starting to get encapsulated in how we think about the website as a part of our company. The first one is that back in the day, in the, in the 90s, websites were treated as a business expense. It was just kind of like the cost of doing business in order for you to survive in the world today. 
And instead, when we look at companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, HubSpot, that are at the, the peak of the game, the way they think about their websites is that it's a, actually an asset. It's a growth uh, business asset. It's an investment. So very much like every month you're investing into your retirement fund, and that's building over time, every single month we're thinking about how do we build into this asset to help our company grow. The other change that happened culturally is back in the 90s in traditional uh, website culture was that it was a digital brochure. You had some kind of print material. And we basically digitized that to have easy access. The change that's happened is that high-performing companies no longer see their business as just a brochure, but instead a product that has a wide impact. Now, let me, let me deconstruct that for a second. Let's talk about product. When we think about product, you as a company, you have products and services that your team builds, right? You have a product, you probably have product people, you have engineers that are actually building this, and you treat it, the, the thought here is that you treat your website exactly like a product, and the amount of energy and time that gets built into the sellable products of, of uh, products or services that your product team builds, you as a marketing team own the website, and that's your product to be able to build and develop. The second part of that is the wide impact. And I think this is interesting when, we, when I ask the question, why do you have a, a business, or why do you have a website? I wanna give an example when we look at the customer journey. And traditionally, uh, we think of the website with little blinders on, right? And this is, I, I don't blame you, I'm a marketer. Uh, my background's in marketing, and in marketing, we think about how do we use our website at this point in the journey to attract visitors and convert leads. And although those are fundamental, those are like starting points, those are, we should get that down, it's important for us to start expanding our view on how the website can be used as a tool to impact other parts of the journey. So thinking about how do we build things like educational centers for uh, either prospects or existing customers? How do we build new customer onboarding? Those first three, five, 14 days that someone post-purchase, how do we onboard them and get them um, to start successfully using? Could we build a, a website onboarding flow? Uh, then we have customer dashboards, driving things like cross-sell and upsell, right? Still directly impacting the revenue that your team is held accountable for, but doing it through the website. And then you probably have some diehard advocates, people that are already going out of their way to talk about your brand. How do we build experiences on the website to help accelerate that? Things like advocacy programs. And so this is one of the examples on how you can expand the impact that your website is having um, outside of just generating leads and visitors. The second one is that the website should be a tool for every company, every department in the company to hit their goals and help the company grow. So an example of this at HubSpot, our number one thing that we need to do as a company to grow, like hands down, is hire good people. That's hands down, we're growing like crazy, we need to hire a ton of new people, we just opened a, new office, a bigger office in Dublin, and we need to hire new people. And so our marketing team, who owns the website, worked hand in hand with the HR team to build a world-class inbound recruiting funnel and centralized place that talks about our careers and what it's like to work at HubSpot in order to try to generate conversions of applicants. So again, outside the normal scope of maybe how we think about our website, but a very powerful tool, and for us at HubSpot, is a critical tool for generating new uh, employees, which ultimately helps the business grow. The last point here in how the perception of the, the, the company should think about the website is going from this subjective assumption nature of the website. Anyone ever been in like a design review and your boss is like, I think we should do it this way. It looks pretty. I'm not sure why, but it looks pretty. Uh, it's no longer that. Of course, you need the website to have good design and be elegant and be on brand, but now we need to start backing up our decisions based off of data. Just like in the software world, in the website world, we now have access to more data and more um, insights to how people are interacting on our site, and we can use that to inform how we improve. So let's think about shifting our culture, shifting our mentality away from this traditional thought and towards more modern way of thinking about where your website fits in at your company. Now the second thing that I want to talk about is process. And process is kind of the how. It's kind of the nuts and bolts of how you build a website. Thinking about that, how many people have gone through a website redesign before? 
I love it. So many hands. What's the first step that you go through when you do a website redesign? What's that? Data analysis. Research. What else? What's that? Testing. Testing, right? You have an existing site. You have people coming to the site. You could probably test some things out to make some more informed decisions, right? All of this boils down to strategy. It's like you need to start with a strategy. Now, traditionally, if you look at a lot of corporate websites, it's a business-focused strategy. It's me, 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 me. Talk about my products. Talk about how we're number one, how we beat our competitors. And so what you see with a traditional website, it's kind of like you build it over here about, you know, in, in its own isolation and kind of throw it at your customers and hope it sticks. Modern companies like HubSpot do the opposite. They meet their customers where they're at and understand, get an empathetic understanding of the world that those customers live in and then weave the website in as a part of that. Right? You see the subtle difference. Instead of building something and throwing it at them, we're, we're instead meeting them where they're at and weaving our, weaving our company as a part of their story. So how do you do that? Well, there are, there are eight steps in the strategy, uh, strategy stage. We're not going to go through each one of them in specifics, but we do have a certification, free certification that goes through all of these in detail. I'll give you the link at the end so that you don't miss any of these. Uh, the first one. As uh, Luke in the front mentioned, we're going to start with user research, UX research. Whether that's qualitative, quantitative, or observational research, we, again, we need to gain that empathetic understanding of the world that our customers live in. From there, we move on to something called jobs to be done. Has anyone heard of jobs to be done? Use it, a couple hands in the corners. All right, I love it. I love that there's not a lot of hands because that's the one of these that we're going to dive a little bit deeper in in just a minute. Um, from there, we're going to look at the business goals. What is the business going to accomplish? Yes, this is a customer-focused strategy, but you as a product manager, if you think of this as a product, you have two, two kind of like people you're serving. You have the customers and the business. Right? You could build something that serves just the business and you're going to lose your customers. You could build something for just your customers and your business can't make any money, right? then you don't have a job. And your goal is to find a balance between the two. And so after you have an understanding of the world your customer lives in, now you can start thinking about the, the other person you serve, the business, so you can find that middle ground of what we need to build in this product to be successful on both ends. So you look at the business goals, what are we trying to accomplish, and how is the website a tool that we can use to uh, achieve those goals for the year? Then we get into fundamental assumptions. These fundamental assumptions are essentially like the core basis, the core pillars of what we know about our customers, what we know about our business, and what we know about how the website plays a part into that. And the reason we call them fundamental assumptions is we like to identify them early so that we can do testing, like we talked about, to validate that we're moving directionally in the right way. Right? So you don't spend all this time and energy building this you know, 30,000 euro website, launch the thing six months later, and then all of a sudden those assumptions are wrong and you just wasted your time and you have to go back to the drawing board. From there, buyer personas. Anyone using buyer personas? Very popular. So we know, uh, we know about our users. We'll explain jobs to be done. Now we're going to build out a fictional representation of each one of the individuals, the stakeholders that we need to win over uh, in order to sell our products and services. Then map their journey out to understand, again, what are they doing along that line and where does our website and our products fit in as a part of that story. And this is where it shifts, where we can start looking at specifically the website. Um, everything before this, if, even if you have nothing to do with web design and you have no interest in web design, everything before this has nothing to do with web design. It's about understanding your customers, which is valuable for sales, for uh, marketing campaigns, for inbound marketing. But here, now we take everything that we learned in the first six steps, and that helps inform the website strategy, the site architecture, the wireframing, the SEO strategy. And all of that, the takeaway here, what you want to walk out with is your wish list. And your wish list is 75 200 amazing ideas about what can you build on this product, on this website, that's going to solve the problems that your customers are running into and help them make progress on their journey. Let's, we're going to double click on just the jobs to be done. Again, we've got a whole certification that goes through this with templates and tools and resources, but let's double click on this since it's, uh, a lot of folks are not familiar. 
So this is a framework that's being used by a lot of um, software companies, HubSpot, Facebook, Google. And the thought is that uh, our customers are trying to make progress on some aspect of their life. And they are hiring our products or services in order to make that progress. There's a good adage that I think illustrates this well. When people go, to, go down to the local hardware store and they buy a drill, they're not buying the drill, they're buying the, the hole. Right? So that's the thought. It's like they're buying the hole. Where Jobs to be Done goes is they take it one step further. And they're like, why the heck do they want this hole in the first place? Like, What desired outcome are they trying to achieve that they are buying a drill and drilling a hole? So this is the question that 3M asked themselves. And they said, why are people drilling holes? So if your outcome is, I want to drill a hole in the wall, put a hook in, hang photos. The outcome is I want to relive the memories of my family's past and create better bonds. Knowing that's the outcome, 3M said, why do you even need a drill in a hole in the first place? Why not just create a peelable sticker that has a hook that you can put on and you get there faster, cheaper, easier than having that. And that was the spark, the innovation, that allowed them to create that new successful sticker. Anyone have those at home? Like they have the little peel off and put on the wall, right? So now you get some insight on how they came to that realization. So again, you have every single person has particular jobs they're trying to accomplish in order to create progress towards a desired outcome. And they hire a product or service to sit in that job function. But when a new product comes that's faster, cheaper, easier, or better, they'll fire the existing product and hire the new product to sit in that place. And this is what we need to be interested in, the switch. What caused them to make that switch in the first place? That's where we need to get interested. If you're curious, if you go to bit.ly slash job TBD, to be done, job TBD, this will take you to a page that's got a script for doing interviews. Here's your pro tip if you want to write this down. The best way to figure out why someone made that switch, find 10 customers that switched to your company in the last 30 days and 10 customers that left your company in the last 30 days. And then use the script that's on that link to interview them and find out what was the scenario that caused them to make that switch. And the reason this is important is once you know that, it will inform the messaging, the positioning, the types of testimonials, the types of case studies, so that you can make that switch happen faster. Who's following along with me on this? OK, cool. So again, at the end of the strategy, you'll walk away with this wish list, 75 to 200 amazing ideas on how you're going to weave the website in uh, as a part of that person's world. And it's time to get building. You actually sit down with the team and you start building this thing out. So for those of you, we had a lot of hands. How, for those of you who have gone through a website redesign, what emotions did you feel as you were going through that website redesign process? Shout them out. Fear? Fear? What else? Overwhelmed. Stress? Overwhelmed? What other emotions? Excited. Excitement? Something new? Hopefully some progress. We did this survey at HubSpot. And we asked the same question to marketers. And we heard just about the same as what we heard here today. If I simplify it down, we have excitement. We have uh, pride. We have hope. Like, please. But then we have all these negative emotions, things like frustration, stress, anxiety, overwhelmed. And my favorite one, which is this one, vacation. Like, just get me the hell out of here. I need like a martini, and I, I just need to relax. Um, and so this is a byproduct of the traditional website design process. Website designs inevitably go over budget and get delivered late. For those of you who've done a website redesign, did it go over budget and get delivered late? I think a lot of nodding heads, people laughing. It's like it's, we've just come to accept that this is just part of the process of going through a website redesign. So why does this happen? Let me, let me let you in on a little secret here. The reason that this happens is because we're trying to seek perfection in our first version of our website. We know that traditionally we will not touch a website after it launches. We know that this is our chance to put in the work, to get the things in, and if we don't do it now, we're not going to get it ever. But the reality is there's no such thing as perfect. And the only way to get close to perfect is to get something out that looks and performs better than what you have today, and then every single month make incremental improvements to get closer and closer to perfect over time. And that's exactly what we're gonna do here. With traditional, we have this huge project that goes over budget, gets delivered late. 
With the modern way of thinking about we're going to launch, what, we're going to build what we call a launchpad site. It's a site that looks and performs better than what you have today, but it's just a starting point on which you can start collecting real user data, start testing, looking at analytics, and start improving over time. How do we build that? We got, again, we talk about it in the certification. I think the misconception there is that it's, a, it's like we're going to pare it down. Right? This is where software and websites get different. It's not a minimum viable website. No one wants a minimum viable website. It's a full website, but we bake in different approaches on how you can build this website to expedite time and get to better results. And we talk about it all in the certification. Well, hopefully, eventually the site goes live. Hope, hopefully. Uh, but what we found when we did a survey is that 42% of marketers only touch their website about once a year after it's live. How many people, let, now here's an honest question, right? Remember what your mother said about honesty. If you lie, it's, it's the, you're going, <laughs> it's the work of the devil. How many people here spend about once a year they go in and they make changes to their website? Like that's not, not talking about blogging, landing pages. Just once a year you go in, you make impactful, impactful changes to your website. Is it more? You do it more times? A couple nods of the heads. Perfect. Let's give these people a round of applause. You beat the 42% of marketers that don't go in and change. But the point is, is that we should be continually thinking about how this is a living and evolving thing so that we get out of the traditional model where we build a site, it goes for two and a half years with very little updates until it's so outdated, performing so poorly that we have to embark on this six-month redesign, uh, overwhelming, stressful experience. And the funny thing is, this looks pretty similar. We saw something like this earlier in the world of software. So then what do we need to do once the site is live? Well, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to talk about my two favorite things to think about after the site is live, and that's building a rhythm and building focus. And the reason these are important is because there's a ton of tactics you can implement, but the tactics are going to change. But process, things like rhythm and um, focus and process are always going to be the same, and it'll help pick the right tactics to implement. So the way we do this is on a quarterly basis, we host something called a quarterly summit. And this is where you pull out of execution mode and you think about things on a higher level. This is really the time for you to change direction of the ship. And so what you do is you talk about what happened the previous year based off, of, or the previous quarter based off of uh, the performance of the site, the goals you're trying to achieve, the things that were implemented, what did you learn uh, based off the experiments you ran, and you determine what are we going to do this next quarter. You're going to set a new theme for the quarter. And there are three themes for a website. The first one is establish. Are we going to continue to establish the foundational elements of the website to weave it deeper into the customer's story and to build additional value. The second one is optimize. Are we going to take what we already have and make it better? And the third one is, are we going to expand the reach and the impact of the website? Are we going to look at new parts of the customer journey, new teams that we can use to implement it? And this goes on the life cycle of a website. Usually when you first launch it, again, your launch pad site's your starting point, you kind of live in that established theme for the first few quarters. Then you can transition to optimize, and then you transition to expand. It's a fluid thing, and eventually you end up back at the top. So once you've set a theme for the quarter, now we start breaking that down monthly. We say, what are we going to do every single month? And you can break that down into sprints. So this may look familiar for those of you who are familiar. Anyone familiar with Agile software development, web design? Agile is the foundation of growth driven design. Uh, or the foundation of, of our process here that we're using, and then we layer things on top, uh, like the next part, continuous improvement. So if you decide that establish is the theme for the quarter, you can then determine the tactics that you want to think about adding to your sprints. And those tactics could be harvesting low-hanging fruit, things that are just very glaring updates that need to be made, things that maybe you wanted to build but not for the first version of the site, Maybe you want to do it in version 1.1, 1.2. You could look at how do we generate more audience to the site. That's common for low traffic sites. It's hard to collect data. It's hard to run experiments. You don't have people coming to the site. And so you can build things in like technical SEO. You can build pillar pages. You can build directories uh, in order to drive more organic traffic to the site to gather more audience. And then you can validate that the things on the site actually are solving problems for your customers. And that's important for the next reason. 
Eventually, you get to the optimize, where you can start looking at tactics to improve usability. Do they find that value quickly? Or does it take them many, many clicks before they're able to unlock that value? Conversion rate optimization. Now, everyone's got their own definition of conversion rate optimization. The way I think of it is there are paths that a user takes on your website to convert on some type of offer of value. And your goal in this is to look at that path and find ways to reduce, streamline, eliminate friction and steps to get them from the beginning to the end as fast as possible. So that's, at this point, some, there's plenty of tactics that you can implement uh, at that point. And then lastly, personalize, creating a non-one-size-fits-none experience for people that are coming to your site, finding uh, based off their stage, based off of their interests, what they've downloaded in the past, videos that they've watched, how do we get to adapt the website experience for those particular individuals. And then the last thing, if you decide that the expand phase is where you're gonna focus that quarter, you can think about building new digital products onto the site. So an example of this that we have at HubSpot is called WebsiteGrader.com. Has anyone ever used WebsiteGrader.com? Ooh, actually a lot of hands, more than I thought. So this is a really simple tool. You put your website in, it'll give you a report, and it tells you the areas of your website that you're doing well on and where you can improve. And it's something that someone would probably pay a couple, couple pounds for, but we offer for free. And so you can think about how do we build new digital products onto the site that people would probably be willing to pay some money for, but we're going to offer for free in order to provide value and start um, engaging them as a, as a, in our audience. Again, we talked about journey. How do we expand it into different parts of the journey? And we talk about how to expand it into different parts of the team. So this is your framework as a product manager, as a website owner, to think about how do you prioritize your time. Once you've determined that for that particular month, you can take your capacity. You know how much time you have in a day, right? And we're going to only block off 80% of that. We're going to leave 20% for flex time. Anyone ever have your boss or CEO go, go to you and say, we need to implement this on the website now. Like, this is just like an update we need to make. We need a new hire, a right, bunch of hands. So you can use that flex time for that. The 80% is used on wish list items. So your wish list is ongoing. Once you, have your, you determine your theme and your focus, you're going to start uh, reprioritizing based off of the impact that those, those items will have, the effort it'll take to implement, and any risks that are associated with them until you have a prioritized wish list and you can draw the line and say everything above this line will be this cycle, everything below this line will reevaluate in the next cycle. Any high effort, high impact um, action items that come out of that? we go on and we write something called an action item card. And this is basically the story of why you're doing what you're doing. This is very important for like if you're, for clarity of the team, it's very important for your bosses. Um, we're gonna go through this quickly. I'd encourage you to snap a photo, but we also have something on, our, on uh, certification. So we start off again with the job to be done. What is the desired outcome someone wants to have? So as a persona, when they find them, what's the situation that they find themselves in what I want to, the action that they want to take, so I can achieve a desired outcome. So you write this out, really simple, one to two sentences, and it gives crystal clarity on who they are, the situation they're in, what they want to, what they want to do, and the outcome they want to achieve. But you're seeing a problem. There's a reason that they're not able to make that outcome happen. So you then write out a, a pr problem statement. But for this persona, they're running into a challenge. And it's a one to two sentence about the problem that they're running into, the friction they're running into, that's preventing them from achieving that outcome. Then your hypothesis statement, what do you want to do to relieve that problem? For persona visiting the page, right? So you can be very specific on where they're visiting, where they're running into this problem. We believe changing the current item into your proposed idea, what change do you want to make, will, and the outcome, and any success metrics you're going to use to measure to see that you're alleviating it. And then there's some like housekeeping stuff, like why do you believe this to be true? If you've done any research that backs this up, you can add that in here. Uh, the expected impact and effort required. And then experimental design is basically um, a fancy way of saying like, how are you going to test this to be true? 
So that could be A-B testing, it could be a cohort analysis, it could be just simply you know, user interviews or user testing, depending on what the action item is. But basically, how are you going to come back six months from now, at, or three months from now, or a month from now, and know that um, it had, had the intended impact, or you could at least learn something about it? OK? So that's the process. Again, on a high level, we're going from uh, starting with a customer-focused strategy, building a site that looks and performs better than what you have today, and then having a very focused and rhythm-based improvement process to month over month make improvements. And what we see is, you know, instead of this set it and forget it to your mentality, we now have uh, this month over month improvement. And of course, marketing and sales lives on top of this. I think one of the flaw, one of the um, misconceptions I see so often is that. Uh, our teams compartmentalize, and they say, this is the web team. They, they deal with the website. This is the marketing team. They deal with that. Here's the sales team. The reality is it all works together. And so until you can have all of those working together, um, you, know, you really can't have a peak-performing website or a peak-performing growing business. Now, as I mentioned, we do have a methodology at HubSpot where we've taken these ideas of modern web design and turned it into a methodology called growth-driven design. It's the new playbook for building peak-performing websites. And for anyone who's interested, we have a free certification. Um, we now have over 1,000 certified agencies in 50 countries. And we asked 300 of them, to, what results have you seen? Like, this is all theory. Like, have you put this into pro uh, um, put this into motion with clients. They saw that with GDD, when they ran GDD with their clients, they saw a quicker time to value. Websites up and off in 60 days, depending on the size of the site, and then on time and improving from there, versus traditional design, 108 days, set it and forget it. And typically two weeks late. But at the end of the day, what your boss cares about, what your business cares about is the results. We asked those same agencies, when you use growth-driven design versus traditional design, what are the results you see six months after launch? And they saw 16.9% more leads and 11.2% more revenue six months after launching it when they use growth gym design process versus traditional. Which just makes sense. Like if you're building and optimizing the site after you launch it, you're, you, you would expect to see an increase in results. But at the end of the day, this is the slide that's going to convince your boss to invest in this type of a process. Again, our free certification, you can go to growthdrivendesign.com. Uh, it's in the HubSpot Academy as well. You're an Academy member. Uh, and you'll get access to all the tools. We have templates, resources, uh, training videos uh, to help you get started and understand how all these pieces work. The last thing that I want to talk about is the shift that's happening with technology in the, uh, in the world of web design. What technology is at, its, at the core of your website? What do you use to build your website? CMS, CMS content management system. This is kind of the foundation on which you, the platform you can use to build up your website. So for those of you who have, we had a lot of people who have gone through redesigns, a lot of people probably use their CMS. What's the most frustrating things that you run into when using your CMS? Shout it out. Security. Security. You have maybe lots of plugins, lots of things you have to maintain, and sometimes those go out of date, and now you have security risks, hacking, DDoS, DDoS attacks. What else? What's the most frustrating thing? Scalability. Scalability. Yeah, the business is changing. The website and the platform need to be able to change with the business. What else? Yeah, over there. Too technical. You need a developer to do any changes. Anyone needed to go to the development team anytime you need to make an update or a change? Oh, yeah, I see a lot of hands. And so that's, those are all symptoms of the traditional CMS. And if we look at Clay Shirky, he's from NYU, he said technology doesn't get truly interesting until it becomes almost invisible. The more advanced the technology gets, the easier it should become to manage. And we see this time and time again with disruption companies that are coming in and, and making it easier to use more sophisticated technology and putting those incumbents out of business. But yet, if that's the case, then CMSs have it all wrong. As we mentioned, as the business grows, it demands more from the website. And as you demand more from the website, more plugins, more web development, more file management, it becomes harder and harder for you as a marketer and as a company to maintain it. 
And what that forces is that the traditional CMS forces you to focus on maintaining the system, not focus on your customers. That's the first change that we're starting to see in technology, is that this high maintenance, low security issue with the traditional CMS. Modern CMSs remove all of that for you. They go the SaaS route. They say, look, we'll just take care of all that stuff, all that annoying stuff, the maintenance, the security, the updates. We'll just take that off your plate to free your time up to focus on your customers and building amazing content and experiences on your site. As we talked about, traditional CMSs rely on gatekeepers. Because it's so complex, because it's so technical, you need to work with developers to be able to make any changes on the site. Now, the problem with that is if you work in a bigger organization, the likelihood is those developers have plenty on their plate already. So guess when you need to make a change, where it goes. It goes very low in the priority list, and it takes a lot of time to make that change. So when you think about continuous improvement and running through those fast cycles, those, those sprints, it starts to slow you down. Modern CMSs instead are build platforms that enable the developers to build the product out in a way that enables the teams to do the work that they need to do. So that no longer do we need to go to a developer for every single update. Those developers can build the system out for the teams to be self-sufficient, put guardrails around it, and then those developers' times are freed up to work on more impactful solutions, more elegant solutions to problems using technology. Should be easy, should be easy for a marketer to use, very visual, not having to get into code to make any changes. And as we talked about, it's also not a one-size-fits-all, uh, one-size-fits-none approach. We see with traditional CMSs that it's very difficult to leverage the data that you have about, that really rich data that you have about your customers, what, they, what they're interested in, where are they coming from, what mobile device, what, what events have they signed up for of yours. It's very hard to leverage that. And so it becomes a very one-size-fits-none uh, fits approach. Every visitor coming to the site gets the same exact experience. Modern CMSs think about how do we tailor that using all that data that we pulled together. We know in our CRM what pages they viewed, what emails they've opened, what videos they've watched, what they've downloaded, what have they purchased in the past. And we can use all of that to inform the, the experience that we serve to those people uh, in our in our um, CMS. Now, the only way to do that is if you start having this really coupled experience between the CMS and the CRM. And lastly, it's about not being fuzzy. Anyone run into challenges about proving the ROI of the work that you're doing to your bosses? See a lot of head shaking, a lot of hands up. It shouldn't be about that. We should, modern CMSs, find a way to prove and attribute the work that you're doing to actual dollars that are being generated for the business. So at a moment's notice when your boss says, how much is this piece of content producing in revenue? How many leads? You'll be able to, to easily create a report and show exactly how you can attribute it back to the work that you're doing. Now the nice thing is, HubSpot's been investing a lot of time over the last few years to, to build a product that lives in this world, that builds a product to enable growth driven design, to enable um, all the things about modern CMSs. And so Digital22, one of our um, big partners in the UK using uh, our CMS, Ricky said, we've seen HubSpot CMS evolve into amazing product, secure, fast, marketer friendly, and data driven. Pairing it, CMS with growth driven design was a natural fit. And it's not just Ricky. Uh, this is G2 Crowd, which is kind of like the Yelp for software reviews. Uh, in 2019, we were ranked number one CMS in terms of overall satisfaction and market presence. Anyone interested in it, if you're a HubSpot customer, or maybe you're just thinking about a website redesign, you want to try it out and see what it's like, you can go to bit.ly slash HubSpot CMS, or just go to our website, and you'll be able to try it out for free. So there you have it, my friends. These are the three forces that are shifting in the web design world. And I hope that it sparks some ideas about how you can take this opportunity that's in front of us to leverage the website to help grow your business uh, and produce better uh, experiences for your customers. I appreciate you spending some time with me. And together, we'll continue to transform the world of web design. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Have we got time for a few questions? Yeah, yeah. Any Q&A? Anyone want to ask Luke anything? 
Time for a couple. This is the time for tactics. I know like everyone wants like specific uh, tactics, go. so I'm happy go to give it. tactics out too. Um, I've got a quick one for you, man. Um, yeah. As as someone who's obsessed with e-commerce, right? So, HubSpot and e-com, is that a thing? Is that a CMS that you you can provide right now? Yeah. So the the cool thing about e-commerce, I think this whole story probably holds even more true in the e-commerce world. I feel like e-commerce is a couple steps ahead, if not more, than a lot of the other types of websites that you would build. So the beautiful thing is, if you're already working in e-commerce, this should be like this is I'm preaching to the choir. With HubSpot. Uh, we don't have, we have some lightweight e-commerce stuff built in. So what you could do is if you have a few products, you have, maybe you just sell one product or you just have a few, we do have in our CRM, you're able to add in um, products and you're able to add in like a buy now button for people to make single purchases. Very simple. A whole e-commerce platform to do it right is a beast of a product. And so what we did is instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, we partnered with uh, Shopify and we have a native Shopify integration. So between the out of the box native Shopify integration, you can purchase Shopify, purchase HubSpot, one click of a button, it'll sync up all the fields, and now whatever data and information you have in Shopify will replicate in your CRM, which then you can replicate on the front end of the website. If you're not using Shopify or you want something more robust, we have an e-commerce bridge that you can use this e-commerce bridge, it's kind of like an SDK for developers, to basically extend that integration into any platform you want. So if you use Marketo or you use um, you know, whatever the, the platform is, you're able to use this e-commerce bridge and our APIs to extend it in. Um, it'll just take maybe some additional development work to like connect all the dots. But that's how we treat it. Um, we just find it's, uh, Shopify is doing such a good job that um, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. We just try to make one plus one equals three by combining it all together. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Time for one more. One more question for Luke. Now let's call it a day then. Thank you very much, Luke. Round of Thank applause, you. please. Thank you.